living their lives with the understanding of the importance of our Lord Jesus Christ's command to be reconciled to one another. And most of you probably are familiar with these four, but let me briefly introduce them to you. The first panelist is Noel Castellanos, who is the founding pastor of La Vieta Community Church, as well as now the president of the Latino uh, Institute and working in the Latino community all over our nation. Then we also have Dr. Leah Gaskin Fitzhugh, who is the Executive Vice President and Academic Dean at Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And also then we have Craig Wan, who is the Ministry Director at Grace Fellowship Community Church in San Francisco, California. And last, and of course probably least, is uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Glenn K. Ryan, who is the Executive Director and Founder of Circle Urban Ministries. I will moderate this, and my role is very simple. I'm going to make sure that at 10 minutes each, they stop. And so this will happen. Each of them have 10 minutes to share a little bit of the perspective that they have on reconciliation. And when all four are completed, then they will have a table dialogue with one another about reconciliation, being able to question one another and talk. We have the privilege then of being in their kitchen as they share these thoughts. So, I turn it over to my brother and friend, Noel Castellanos. been truly putting into practice in uh, real ways my commitment and mandate and call to be a reconciler. And I have to confess that it, uh, it would be a lot easier if it wasn't for one thing, uh, other people. <laughs> I mean, if I could just deal with, uh, you know, others on my terms and if everybody was just like me, it'd be great. But uh, the, the mandate to love people the way Jesus has loved me is something that makes me pull out my hair sometimes and think, man, how am I going to really be a reconciler and pastoring a church that is first generation Mexican Americans, uh, second, third generation like myself, Anglos, a couple African Americans here and there, and others. I'm thinking, you know, how in the world can we truly express love to one another and really live out this mandate to be reconciled one with another? Well, one of the things that has helped me and that I'm really struggling with right now is the whole idea that if you're really going to be a reconciler, if I'm going to really be a reconciler, I need to be about the simple uh, thing of love, loving people the way Jesus Christ loved me. And, and this is what I've, uh, I'm starting to conclude, that love is not how I feel about people who are different than myself, but rather love is how I behave towards others even though they are different from myself. I want to read a passage out of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, just a couple of verses that all of you are familiar with. It's the love passage that we romanticize and we use it for marriages and you know every now and then we'll throw it in when we talk about reconciliation between the races. But looking at uh, Starting in verse 4, it says, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable and it keeps no record of when it has been wronged. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. So what does this mean practically as I put that into practice? If I'm a reconciler, that means that I need to be patient with people that are different than myself. What does that mean? Showing self-control in the face of adversity. When I work with people that are different from me, I'm going to face adversity. I've exp I, you know, I don't have time to tell you all the stories. And when people work with me, they, they'll say they've had to face adversity because of me. Okay? So patience, uh, if I'm a reconciler, I'll live it out through patience. Number two, through kindness, which I, I say is giving attention, appreciation, and encouragement to others. 
You know, it is very difficult sometimes for me to truly appreciate and then encourage other people who are different than myself. But if I'm really going to be a reconciler, it means knowing people well enough, approaching them, getting close enough to them so that I can be kind according to the scripture. Third is humility. Uh, it is impossible for me to be a reconciler if I'm not humble. And what does that mean? Is it being that doormat? All of us have felt like that in many times, you know, that, you know, if I'm really going to be a reconciler, I just got to like be that, let them, let people just step all over me and my, who I am doesn't count. But I'm saying that humility is disclosing who I am, allowing others to do the same thing without arrogance. When, we're, when we are able to disclose who we really are. I'm Mexican-American, I'm Chicano, I'm bilingual, I'm bicultural. I feel like a minority, some, I, you know, I feel left out a lot of times. I feel alienated sometimes. But if I can do that without arrogance, uh, I can truly become a reconciler. Next, respectfulness. Treating others as significant and important. You know, uh, if I'm honest, I look at somebody that's different from myself and I sometimes have a difficult time as seeing them as created in the image of God and saying that they're really important. Selflessness, meeting the legitimate needs of, needs of other people that are different than myself through sacrifice and service. You know, all of us have needs, and if I'm called to be a reconciler, Jesus met my need for salvation and so many other things. How can I truly be selfless by meeting the legitimate needs of others? Number six, forgiveness. And I'll tell you, this is where the rubber meets the road. Giving up resentment towards others when I am wronged. Any of you ever been wronged by somebody who is different from you, who doesn't understand your culture, who makes a comment? If to be a, truly to be a reconciler is to give up the resentment towards that person when I'm wrong. Number seven is honesty. Being free from deception to the best of my ability. You know what that means? It's not being afraid to speak the truth, not being afraid to hold other people accountable when you think that they're, what they're saying or thinking is not what you know, doesn't represent you well or whatever, holding others accountable, being willing to uh, give people honest feedback when you believe that there's misunderstanding or that they don't have the whole story. Number eight is commitment. Is without a commitment to say, oh, God has called me to be a reconciler and I'm going to do it no matter what comes my way. I'm committed to be a reconciler and that's, you know, that's the call of God on my life. Now, I want to close by... Uh, some honest feedback uh, for us here as I've been a part of CCDA for 12 years. Number one is that we cannot tolerate speaking about reconciliation in only black and white terms anymore. Okay? When we speak about reconciliation, we got to open the doors and say Latinos, Asians, Native Americans, and others have to be included. And, and see, sometimes we do it because we speak out of our perspective, but we know in this community we're saying we're opening the door to be reconciled with broader cultures. And so let's don't speak about reconciliation only in terms of black and white. Number two is we must acknowledge, okay, and I got to tell, I'm speaking to myself and to my other Latino brothers and sisters in the room as well, but we got to acknowledge that not all Latinos are at the, ta at the CCDA table yet, and that there is an incredible diversity uh, in the Latino community that uh, we have to acknowledge. One of the most frustrating things for many of us is when somebody calls and says, oh, you're Latino or Hispanic? You know, yes, I am, but I'm also Mexican, okay? There's Guatemalans, there's Puerto Ricans, there's, you know, people from Panama, from the Caribbean, from every country from Mexico, which is different than my experience. And so coming to an understanding that there is a diversity, close to 30 nations uh, in the Latino community, and we lump them all together as one. So we need understanding. Uh, the way God has worked in my life, there's a brother, a Puerto Rican brother born in Chicago, Isaias, that I'm learning from, and I have to get to know who he is if I'm really going to be reconciled with him. I have a, a New York Rican brother, Danny Cortez, Puerto Rican, born in New York that I have to get to know, and I have to know that he's different than me, even, even though we both have the same color skin and speak a little Spanish. Jeffrey De Leon from Guatemala is a good friend. We have different cultures, like different foods, but yet we're 
Latino. Jose Luis Bravo is one of my best friends in La Villita. He's from a little, uh, it's, it's a big city called Puebla outside of Mexico City, but he grew up as a farmer up in the hills and he doesn't speak any English and he's one of my very best friends. That's all? One more minute, Noel. Okay. So Jose Luis, Jose Luis is one of my very best friends, and yet we have very little in common in terms of our experiences. But we're able to be reconciled because I have taken the time to get to know him. He's done the same thing. And so Jose Luis, a Mexican who lives in the United States, is, is uh, I'm able to be reconciled with him. Roberto Guerrero, a Dominican uh, who lives in, and works in the Dominican Republic, very different. You know, when he speaks Spanish, I kind of got to listen and scratch my head because he says, como tu ta? And, and, and that means, how are you? I don't even understand him half the time. But part of that, Sorry about that. I, get a, I get an extra minute, right? Five, you get five extra seconds. Okay. And then finally, I have a good friend here, Ava, who's Cuban-American, who I've been getting to know over the last couple of years. And as a Cuban-American, her experience is very different than mine as a Mexican-American. And so reconciliation cannot just, uh, when I talk about the Latino community, it's a diverse community. And uh, we cannot just uh, lump us all into one uh, uh, category. Now, the okay, Noel, we appreciate your great comments. Let's give Noel a round of applause. Jesus emptied himself and unto death. 
we have to, if we're going to suffer in the incarnational witness of Jesus for that which is most central to us, we have to be able to have a vision that is one with the incarnate Jesus. And one of the things that I, I struggle with as I, as I talk about this, which is slightly different than in terms of the looking at the Latino and the Asian situation, and this is a challenge for me, but I'm going to say it. While I believe that we have to have room at the table for all groups, there is still unfinished business in this America which was built for the most part on the lands and the talents of the Native Americans and the African Americans long before we struggled with other, with other uh, groups. That there's unfinished business in this country between white people and Native Americans and African Americans. And that has to be addressed. Now, it, 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 it should be addressed with all parties at the table so that all others will profit from the confession and the repentance that has to take place and that the, and that the mistakes of the past will not be repeated. And I have to say that because unfortunately in this country, around this concept of vision, white people were given a blurred vision of who they are when they were told that they could use their whiteness as a privilege, or whiteness as a wage. I have tell the story quickly of a white mill worker in North Carolina who hated Martin Luther King, who hated anything that was black. That's, what, that's how this person was raised. And he was poor, along with other poor mill workers. They started talking about unionizing. And the management and the owner said, oh no, you don't want to unionize because if you do, we're going to hire the black people over you. You're going to lose your job. But look, you don't have to unionize. No, that means you won't have any benefits, you won't have any pension, but you'll have your whiteness. And that will mean that you have something over and above what those black people don't have. That concept structured a significant part of the economic growth and development in this country, and it blurred the vision of white people who could have, had they not bought into the myth of that privilege, the opportunity to join with poor black, poor blacks and poor, poor whites as an alliance against those forces that would seek to keep them poor and other people rich. So that as we seek to understand what we're going to do about poverty in this country, we have to address the fact that there is a significant construction of identity on the part of white people historically, and it continues today, that their whiteness becomes a privilege and it elevates them above others and blurs their vision for their own humanity and the humanity of others. The third B has to do with victory. And it's no more apparent for me than what is happening in Florida today. 124 years ago in the Hayes-Tilden situation, we had this same challenge, except that it was 200 and some votes that separated. But one of the conditions for Hayes going into the presidency for a one-year term was that he would dismiss the federal troops from the South, which meant that this was about 10 years after uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. It meant that all of those free blacks were going to be left to the terror of the Ku Klux Klan, who were basically clergy, business, and government people riding at night in hoods. And that kind of, of, um, of neglect, that kind of criminal behavior was a condition for this man to become president. That's when the presidency contributed to the oppressive system that we have in this country. The other condition was that those people who had contributed to dismantling reconstruction, which would have permitted an opportunity for equality, were given additional financial aid, which was counter to what the freedmen never received in terms of 40 acres in a room. What we're seeing in Florida today is that God is saying there will not be any major winners 
unless you all find a way to have some kind of reconciliation in terms of respecting the humanity and the dignity of each other. And Dr. Fitzhugh, yes. one minute, please. And so what I want us to give attention to is when we look at reconciliation, to let's go up under uh, the system and the structures that have perpetuated oppression of people of color, women, and others in this country, and search for the reconciliation presence which would grant us shared value, shared vision, and shared victory. Thank you. Okay, Craig. Being an Asian American in a primarily black and white conversation about racial reconciliation is a bit like being at a good football game. The game is intense, with a lot of back and forth, each side using different offensive and defensive strategies. It is an emotional encounter, and there are periodic, periodic eruptions of anger, rage, and frustration. But the two sides have had this, for, had this conversation for a long time, and so they've gained common language and rules of engagement. Asian Americans, with a different set of circumstances in history, are inclined to stand on the sidelines, unsure of how to enter into the conversation. In this brief opportunity, I hope to make a case for Asian involvement in the reconciliation discussion. But I also plan to share about why being the church, as obvious as that might sound, must be central to our reconciliation efforts. Let me begin by sharing um, uh, a little bit about the Asian American experience. Uh, and, and obviously, I've got a very short time to do this, but I want to talk a little bit about what the Asian experience has been in America. Last night, as we walked around Times Square, uh, an Anglo man came up to us and casually said, Ni hao, huh? and then walked off. And it makes us ask the question, how can we assume that we are Chinese? And how can we assume that we speak Mandarin? How about Cantonese? Cantonese. Is he aware that there are Chinese like myself who don't speak Chinese at all? Can he know whether our origins are from Taiwan, or Singapore, or mainland China? And if in the mainland, are we from the northern or the southern provinces? It makes a difference. Now, I want to assume that this man was trying to be hospitable, but in that moment, he did what most white Americans do, and that is to view all Asians monolithically. But we are not, and we certainly don't all look alike. We are Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Filipino, Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodian, Thai, Hmong, Indian, Pakistani, Indonesian, Malaysian, Samoan, and the list goes on and on. Another tendency on the part of many Americans is to assume that if you're Asian, you must have just arrived last month. <laughs> My brother and his wife recently had opportunity to stay with a white couple in Pennsylvania, a very hospitable and pleasant couple, but one that they had never met before. Upon getting acquainted, the woman asked, I, I notice your name is Wong. You must be Chinese. Welcome to America. <laughs> Having no clue that Chinese have been in America for over five generations. In a similar incident, a white Presbyterian pastor from Albuquerque once asked my wife and I, now how would you all end up with names like Craig and Tina? As if expecting names off the label of a soy sauce bottle or something. <laughs> I explained to him that my family dates back to the mid-1800s California, when Chinese were brought in by the thousands to provide cheap coolie labor for mining and later on the building of America's railroads. You see, while we do not, do not share, our African, share with our African American brethren the terrible legacy of institutional slavery, we have a fairly ugly history of our own. My great-grandfather lived during a time of increasing anti-Asian American sentiment in America. We came to be despised by white Americans, even though our heavy labors were instrumental in building the economic infrastructure of the West. In 1854, the California Supreme Court denied Chinese the right to testify against a white person in court, stating that Chinese were, quote unquote, a race of people whom nature has marked as inferior and who are incapable of progress or intellectual development beyond a certain point. Allowing them to testify would admit them to all equal rights of citizenship, and we might end up seeing them at the polls and in the jury box, upon the bench, 
and in our legislative halls. Does that sound familiar? By 1882, prejudice against Chinese was so great that the U.S. government responded with an unprecedented racially, racially based immigration law, the Chinese Exclusion Act, to stem the tide of this quote-unquote yellow invasion. This was followed in subsequent dec decades with various forms of legislation that barred or significantly restricted both Asians from entering into the country. This anti-Asian predisposition on the part of the American government found its ugliest expression in 1941 when 110,000 Japanese Americans, most of them American citizens, were imprisoned in internment camps without due process. Any and all Japanese were viewed as a yellow peril, a national security threat. As Western Defense Commander General DeWitt declared, a Jap is a Jap. It makes no difference whether he's an American. You can't change a Japanese by giving him a piece of paper. 20 years later, in the early 60s, the American perception of Asians as being backward and foreign was replaced by this idea of the model minority. And this was due primarily to the national statistics that revealed that Asian Americans' income levels were uh, matched or even exceeded those of white Americans, or as Newsweek put it, outwhiting the whites. <laughs> in the midst of nationwide urban riots and the rise of the civil rights movement, Asian Americans became the proverbial poster boy for the great American experiment. It basically said, just look at these, what these Asian minorities have done. With a little hard work and perseverance, you too can have the, the American dream. And as you might expect, this notion has been used by conservative politicians to make a case against affirmative action. The model minority myth served to maintain the status quo, justifying an unjust system, and does absolutely no good for race relations between minorities. This mentality, I believe, only served to exacerbate the tensions between African and, African and Korean Americans during the riots incited by, Rodney King, by the Rodney King verdict in 1992. At worst, the model minority myth can ascribe to us insidious and false claims of cultural and genetic superiority, but as Asian Americans, we must reject any perceptions that are made of us that can create such divisiveness. The model minority myth is also dangerous because it can obscure the needs of the growing Asian poor in our country. The latest census shows that while one-third of Asian families are doing very well financially, one-fifth of the Asian population live at or near poverty level. We don't often think of Asians when conservative policies continue to put the squeeze on food stamps and other safety nets. Yet millions of Asian Americans have left extremely difficult economic and political situations in their own home country only to find new obstacles to overcome in the U.S. Finally, various stereotypes that have victimized Asians tend to get recycled. For example, the yellow peril mentality has resurfaced around Wen Ho Lee at the Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. Accused as a spy for China, even though he is a Taiwanese-born U.S. citizen, Dr. Lee appears to have been used as a scapegoat for a host of players looking to either save their skin or further their political agendas. Asians as, as scapegoat has had physically violent dimensions as well, as you might remember with the case of Vincent Chin in, 1990, in 1982 in Detroit. In the midst of an economic downturn in the American automobile industry in the wake of Japanese success, this Chinese man was beaten to death by two white auto workers recently laid off from their jobs. I want to share these stories not to rehearse our wounds, but simply to make the point that as Asians, we have our own unique history and experience, and therefore unique contributions to make to the ongoing conversation of race relations and reconciliation in, in, the, U in the U.S. Having said this, I want to talk some about the role of identity, and particularly Christian identity. Do I think of myself as an Asian American Christian or a Christian Asian American? It seems innocent enough to label myself as an Asian American Christian, or more specifically, to, uh, as a Chinese American Christian. And yet, what does this say about my starting point? Does my, Chinese, Chinese, uh, does my Chineseness inform my Christianity, or does my Christian identity inform my Chinese Americanness? And this question is crucial. Asian Americans who have made it in this country, which I believe is true of most of you Asians in this room, grew up with a host of expectations and values, including such things as family loyalty, intra-racial marriage, higher education, professional success, and therefore financial invincibility. This notion of financial invincibility provides a classic example of what happens when a Christian principle is run through our own cultural grid. We are quick to take the biblical language of good stewardship as an imperative to pat our savings accounts and investment portfolios. The biblical stewardship has much more to do with reckless generosity. And whether or not we're aware of it, we've been trained up to be good Americans, or at least to compete, as li to, to compete like one, which may be good for the economy, but is disastrous to us as disciples. You see, as Asian American followers of Jesus, we, we may shun idolatrous aspects of our Asian culture, such as ancestor worship, but we have a much harder time calling into question our Americanism. Craig? And, yes? You have one more minute. Great. 
And I would argue that this is not only true of Asians, but for the rest of us as well. Michael Emerson and Christian Smith observe in their recent book, Divided by Faith, that many American values such as freedom, individualism, independence, equality of, of opportunity, derive largely from the confluence of evangelical Protestant Christianity and the Enlightenment philosophy. Like a, like a smoothly blended soup, the flavors of American values so well combine these traditions that both evangelical Christians and secularists could ladle from the same kettle. The degree to which we can acknowledge that this is true should alarm us and cause us to ask serious questions about how we understand our calling as the church. Despite all efforts to trumpet the cause of justice and reconciliation by Christians and non-Christians alike, the chasm between the haves and the have-nots has continued to spiral out of control. Might it be because, as Emerson and Smith would apply, that larger American assumptions like personal rights and freedoms, self-indulgent consumerism, and the pursuit of the American dream remain unchallenged? And is it possible that, that we, the church, don't challenge these things because we're not willing to let go of them ourselves? Have our definitions of justice become more American than Christian. Those of us who. Okay, Glenn. Almost 30 years ago, my wife and I thought we had died and had gone to heaven because yes, we found yes. the church uh, in Chicago that was a mixed church. Chicago, in uh, Chicago, Saul Alinsky, the great uh, patron saint of community art organizing, said integration in Chicago is the, the time in between when the first black family moves in and the last white family moves out. Uh, and that's pretty much true. There, there's not a lot of mixing in Chicago. And so my wife and I, who were new in urban ministry, uh, found a church that was talking about racial issues and dealing with urban issues and it was called Circle Church and we really literally were uh, beyond expression of how great it was. In four short years that church split racially right down the middle. Black folks went one direction and white folks went another direction and one of the few persons that we could talk to that had any sense of understanding of this was Dr. Perkins. And I remember John saying to us that this thing called racism has damaged us all. And I want to talk a little bit about this thing called damage and how it's damaged us. And I also want to express uh, a little bit of history. And to begin with, to talk a little bit about Spencer Perkins. I think the tragedy of the loss of Spencer Perkins is that he was becoming a prophetic voice that spoke to this is issue of damage and really the damage of racism within himself. And he was coming to understand this issue of grace in his own life and the challenge of becoming an agent of grace as a black man and as a person of a race who had received a lot of damage. In effect, Spencer was talking about the concept of cleaning up his own backyard. And I think the loss of that voice, of Spencer's voice, has been very uh, deeply felt. And there's a sincere, uh, I mean, a genuine void, I think, in our discussion about reconciliation. And I think I'd like to talk about that a little bit uh, with the panel. And I've really kind of come to the conclusion after 30 years of struggling with this, uh, one of my things is that I'm a little fatigued uh, on this whole race issue. And the other thing is that I've come to a conclusion that there's really little that I can do other than addressing the issue in myself and with people that are very much like me. So I've kind of come to the conclusion that we all need to clean up our own backyard when it comes to this issue. So my comments are going to be more directed to people just like me, kind of white, uh, middle class, evangelical Christians. Racial reconciliation uh, became kind of a popular thing in the 90s, the 1990s. Uh, uh, Chris Rice has documented the kind of books that were written in the 90s and the kind of popularizing that I would kind of call a, a, a pop um, understanding of, of racial reconciliation. And as we look at what happened in the 90s, we can kind of come to uh, uh, understanding that maybe we made some real progress in the 90s. But as I look at it, I think what happened in the 90s, because much of what was written, read, and talked about in the 90s, and I'm one of those authors who contributed to that, 
was pretty much relational and it was pretty much anecdotal. And so if whatever happened through promise keepers or whatever popularization of this issue of racial reconciliation, in my estimation was pretty much more cognitive than it was functional. It was more dealing with attitudes than it really resulted in any actions. It was more about individuals than it was about institutions, and it was more emphasizing relations uh, with people of a different, you know, getting a relationship with somebody of a different race than it was addressing any of the issues of s systemic racism and the results of that. So now I think as we look at where we're going and this issue of racial reconciliation, particularly as it applies to us, I think we have to look at the fact that there, in my estimation, has not been a lot of progress. There's been a lot of talk, or some talk, but there has not been a lot of progress. And the book that, that Craig mentioned it is this book entitled Divided by Faith. And the interesting thing about this book is that it is really probably one of the first evangelical, although it's not published by an evangelical press, but it's a contribution of uh, some of the first academic evangelicals who have weighed in with empirical evidence and data. It's done by a, it's, it's a work that's done on a study by these uh, two men and others funded by Pew. And they basically have analyzed what we, this issue of racial attitudes in the white evangelical world. Although they do speak some to other minorities, they mainly are addressing the, the issue in the, the issue of the majority. And of course, any issue that is an issue for the majority, whether that is a majority of anything, becomes the issue. And when you look at and get to the foundation of what Emerson and Smith are saying in this work, is they're essentially saying that evangelical theology, or the theology or the lifestyle of evangelicals works against racial reconciliation. This is what Julius Wilson says uh, on the back of this book. Emerson and Smith provide an interesting account of how white evangelicals perpetuate the very radical or racist visions they publicly oppose. Now, the saddest thing about this I believe this is kind of a blockbuster book, is that when you talk to people about this, this is my experience, I talk to others about this and say this is an incredible book because it documents that evangelicals uh, subvert reconciliation rather than help it, and people kind of shake their head. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I can believe that. That's a little bit like saying, you know, James Dobson, you know, does abortions in his back room. That, to me, is how radically opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ this is, um, the evidence that is brought out by this. There's two reasons that they say this is the case. They say, essentially, that white evangelicals live in a cultural isolation. That is, we're separated from the rest of the world. And we live in our own world. And the second thing is that the distinct uh, tools of evangelicals we all have social tools, that is, these are the tools that we interpret the world by. And they are saying that the specific cultural tools of evangelicals essentially are counter to reconciliation. Dr. Perkins talks about several of these uh, and, and has today and probably will every time he ever speaks uh, when he talks about individualism, uh, our understanding of being an, uh, individually reconciled to God through this personal relationship, there's an aspect of that that isolates us from a corporate responsibility. So this in isolation and what I would call this cultural sh theology works together to really mean that evangelicals uh, are a detriment to reconciliation rather than a help. The book also says that whites now, as, and this is, this is a significant shift in our culture, but that white evangelicals would say that race is a big problem in our country. But few of them say that it's a problem that concerns them. It really isn't important to them. And so therefore, they don't think very much about it. Now, for different reasons, and this is all I'm going to kind of this is the only bit that I'm. Glenn, you're yes. on your last minute. I'm going to diverge away from uh, talking about white folks, but for different reasons, 
black folks think the same thing. That is, that they live, I think, thinking that the problem is somebody else's. The problem is the problem of white folks. So we now are in this racial reconciliation standoff. And I believe that CCDA carries a significant opportunity because as uh, members of CCDA, we don't live or we shouldn't live in the same degree of isolation of our theology and our practice and isolation of where we live our life. And so I think we can become contributors and maybe I'll wait for uh, some panel discussion to talk about how we could actually be those contributors and particularly impact the institutions that perpetuate and continue our problems. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> we now open it up for dialogue between our four panelists. I, I would like to uh, just start by um, picking up on a comment that uh, Leah made about um, the fact that we're not going to truly be able to experience reconciliation without embracing or experiencing uh, pain and the suffering and the sacrifice of uh, uh, akin to what Christ had to do uh, to bring reconciliation with us. I think uh, one of the, the things that becomes, uh, I guess, personal or very difficult to articulate is when we hear comments like, uh, okay, you know, uh, yeah, the pain that Latinos feel is important, but there's other issues or in the African American community or the Native American community, what's really, you know, what's happened there and the injustices that we've suffered, and we, we got to really start here. Because, and what we hear uh, is uh, that, is a pain that's much more legitimate or is even deeper than any pain that I, as a Latino, have ever experienced or felt. And I think uh, there's, there's a, a, a reaction that comes out when, uh, when we hear a comment like that. And the tendency can be to say, well, OK, then I, I don't want to come to the table because from the very beginning, I'm going to be an outsider. And, and there's a sense that I'm not legitimized and when I come and say, listen, uh, when, I, when we see the hurt and the suffering and the uh, lack of inclusion for Hispanic Latinos in this country, somehow that, that, that is not as important, okay? Or maybe it doesn't need to be dealt with at the same level as other kind of injustice. I guess a response to me would be uh, when, I, when I really uh, seek to let God lead and guide me is to say, you know what? It could be that our pain, to whatever level we've experienced it, uh, can truly unite us. And that as we can experience solidarity with one another and, and seek to say, you know, yeah, I have experienced whatever you've experienced as an African American or as a Native American, but I tell you something, I believe, I'm, I'm with you, and I believe that I, I, I'll do anything I can to understand that in a deeper way because I am your brother as well. And, and that maybe that, that will cause the opportunity for greater empathy uh, towards uh, the Latino community, even though there's a sense that we have not experienced the same kind of injustice uh, from your perspective. I can appreciate um, your response to what I, what I wish I had uh, more time to develop. Let me try to respond to it in this one. I'm really not talking about equality of pain so much. I'm, I'm not trying to say, I'm not measuring that. But I do believe, for example, that when men and women have issues, that as much as it would be helpful for two men to sit down and talk about it, or two women to sit down and talk about it, men and women have to talk about it. So that the respective positions of all of the parties who are involved have to be brought to the table. No, no matter how well meaning all men may think they can handle issues between men and women, or no matter how well meaning all women could, a man and a woman with an issue, that has to be addressed by a man and a woman. I'm saying the same thing as it relates to uh, the history of this country 
and the way in which so much of the behavior that goes towards Latino and Asian comes out of a failed system that if we had the opportunity, Hayes Tilden, uh, 1876, we had the opportunity many times in this country to turn around issues of injustice and systems of injustice to make them more just so that by the time we would have to indeed deal with others, we would have a more whole system to offer you. So I know you are hearing me uh, through a kind of rational uh, motif, but I really am talking about, I'm talking about something of the heart here. I mean, I know there's the mental analysis, but I'm talking about where there's the need to, to understand, to, to have so Psalms 52 create in me a, a new heart and a new spirit within me. And I'm saying that the promises of this country, the broken promises to Native Americans, you cannot just ride on out without addressing that. It is criminal. Our neglect of the Native American. I don't have to be Native American to be disappointed with the behavior that we have. One of the largest dropout rates, one of the largest um, alcohol rates. And they're silent. And we're silent along with them. Until we attend to what we did to African Americans, I mean, and to the first the Native Americans. I'm acknowledging the hierarchy here in terms of what happened. So if we take that back four or five hundred years ago, when we were mapping the blueprint of this country and how we would treat human beings, that Native Americans and African Americans were not fully human beings, and we treated them that way really up until we were able to have the Civil Rights Movement, which is only a period of about 50 years ago. So we have four years of, of, of neglect, 50 years of recovery, I'm saying that there are voices that still must be heard, confession and repentance, and that some of the lessons that we need for how we live today, all of us, some of the wisdom that I should be able to give you out of this experience that I cannot give you because the experience has still not produced the wisdom it needed. So that we build up. I'm not trying to make, I, 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 I know that it's a risk in this, and I knew there would be the possibility of hearing it this way for further. But there is a truth to this that says that we built so much of America on a lie, mm. on the fact that people of color were inferior to People of color weren't human beings. Native Americans didn't even exist. We have to correct those truths by confession and attention to it. Only then can we receive the richness of your contribution and on a level playing field. Because it, as it is now, you will just be dumping your pain on top of all the other pain. And we won't be able to respond to you because we haven't handled our own responsibility. So it's, it's about understanding that you cannot have reconciliation without truth. And if you are living a lie, then reconciliation is not going to come into play. I, I guess this, though, for me, is part of the fatigue issue. Uh, because I guess Looking at world history, uh, whether it's Bosnia or whether it's um, uh, Africa with uh, you know centuries of tribal conflict, uh, I can't come up with an example of any country uh, that has ever gone back previous generations and dealt with the sins of previous generations to the point where it brings healing. To the, to the current, well, that's South Africa, the jury is still
still up on that. I mean, South Africa is attempting to do that, but I think the jury is still out on whether that will will really bring uh, healing or not, because uh, there's still an awful lot of uh, issues in South Africa. But as Christians, I guess my question is, as Christians, and and uh, this is where I think Spencer was really struggling, how does this issue of grace uh, really come in as I appropriate appropriate grace in my own life to deal with my own things. And back to my comment is that I think we are all damaged. So I would say, yes, white people need to really deal with your with your comments. I think we really need to take responsibility on how we are benefiting by the privilege that was created philosophically in this country and now is inherited, even though we've dropped that philosophy from the front line. We still deal with the results of that. However, uh, if I just hear your comment, it's kind of like, well, if all white people ask for forgiveness and we did something about it, then there would be no other issues. Uh, and I think uh, Satan has used racism uh, or uh, prejudice of all levels universally, and we are all damaged because of that. And we all, all have issues. And I think part of the conflict that we have in this thing is that we are all good at articulating the other issues of the other side, and very few are accepting responsibility for the issues of their side. So that's what's going on in Florida. Republicans can articulate the Democrats' issue, you know, why they should, should quit, and the, Republican, and the Democrats are saying why uh, they should have the recount, but nobody is saying what's just and what should I be doing to bring about justice. And it goes on and, and on and on and on. I'd just like to add something to that. Um, when, I, when I hear um, um, the proposal that we would wait until the black and white conversation is, has been adequately addressed, Okay. But that's, that's what you heard. Yeah. Um, we've been waiting a long time. And, and, I, I, and, and, I, and I don't want you to, to misunderstand me. This is, it is not that um, you know, we're just, you know, it's not like we're sitting back here saying, hey, let us in this, this, this party, because it's not a party. <laughs> and it is, it, is, it is an awful situation that we're in. Um, when I think about um, and, and this is at the risk of sounding, getting into a therapeutic sort of mode here, and I don't want to do that. that it's not the intention, but it, it, going back to your analogy you know, of, the, of the husband and wife or man and woman trying to, to work out the differences, you can't just have two men talking about it. Um, and and I, I think of this whole race quagmire that we're in as, 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 as very much like a dysfunctional family situation where, where there, there is just, I mean, if you, if you take take the, uh, the mother and father and, and, and the three kids. Um, who, who in that, in that system can, can carry the conversation? Who can bring that family out of that situation? Um, or if there's just, uh, I mean, if, 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 if the mother and father are, are in this, this no-win no, no situation, um, neither one of them is going to be able to bring, bring them out of it. Um, and, uh, and, and, and others in that family um, can actually bring some objective light to the situation because they are also experiencing um, the, the, the fruits and uh, uh, um, of, of or the negative fruits of that of, of that situation. But even there, I mean, uh, the children would not be able to would, would not be able to bring family out of its out of its quagmire. And uh, I think that um, you know one of the I think one of the unfortunate things um, that we experience as as, uh, as evangelical Christians is that I think we do throw a lot of language around, and so reconciliation, justice, and even the words grace um, have have, uh, have gotten trivialized, or they have gotten watered down, um, and we, 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 we've got begun to lose bearing on what they mean. Craig. And the rest of you, we have about five minutes left, so to make sure you all jump in with what you need. Yeah. But I, I think all I want to all, all I want to say is that is that as 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 body believers, we have to somehow believe that the mysterious gospel um, is enough to carry us through this thing and to bring us through this thing. Um, then we can fully affirm the, uh, the, the
bringing together and all of us to the table at the same time. Let me, let me in the recognition of five minutes, take about one or two report so that we can bring this to closure. Um, when I made my statement, I said that we would all be at the table together. I specifically said that. I did not say that you would wait until I had finished speaking for the dialogue to move forward. What I said was that there are, there are uh, dialogical um, witnesses that need to take place that have not taken place in this country out of confession and, and repentance. And until that takes place, when we really aren't going to know about our power to move, to move ahead, in, 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 as I see it. And so what I'm calling for is a kind of that allows um, us, that allows the demonstration of the possibility so that all of the table can bear witness to that. And um, can, and I, I specifically said so that the errors of the past are not committed in the future in any way. And that's one way that I believe that we can protect ourselves from that. And with regard to grace, grace operates best as I understand it, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Grace operates best when we come to the end of ourselves, when we are at our weakness, when we stop and when God takes over. And what I'm saying in this kind of dialogue is that while we may be fatigued, some of us have come to the end of ourselves, to the kind of phenomenal weakness that God grace intervenes and then provides for us the kind of witness that I think is possible in terms of this dialogue. It is inclusive, but, but I am not saying, I think it's dangerous to say, to think that multiculturalism means that we all blend into one voice. We all have distinctions, we all, our gifts are our distinctiveness. We're supposed to bring the richness of those differences, both in God-given talents and in experiences to the table, and then in the midst of our weakness, see what God's grace does with that. It doesn't mean we deny who we are, but we allow God's grace to enhance who we are. I, I think uh, very uh, surely, I, I do believe that, that, the, that the, the kind of love that God demonstrated to us, that agape love that is unconditional and, and, and it resulted in Christ hanging on the cross for, for every human being that's ever lived in this world, regardless of color or creed or anything else, that that is the power to overcome the divisions and the walls that are constructed, the races, all the answers that you talked about there. And, you know, it is so simplistic, but it's not that, you know, it's not feelings, it's not all that, it's that love that was described in that passage that I read. And, you know, whether we like it or not, as Christians, that's what we're called to, is to love one another. Now, it isn't fluff, it's real hard work, and, 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 and it's something that we've got to commit ourselves to. Now, uh, I guess... Noel, I'm very sorry. <laughs> but we are out of time. Let's give our panelists a big round of applause for their time that they've spent with us. Our goal today in CCDA is to again raise up this discussion of reconciliation to go beyond the little apologies and little sometimes almost trite things that we do in reconciliation and to dig deeper. And I think that God did a wonderful job with these four people to be able to get us to some new issues that we might be able to 